I stood by the window and watched as the car backed down the driveway, turned right, and then disappeared down the street. I wondered why I wasn't more upset. I had just seen ten years of my life drive away. Shouldn't I have felt something? Shouldn't there have been more than just a shrug of the shoulders? Oh well, I guess I should go and take care of that dripping faucet. As I turned and headed for the kitchen, I replayed the events of the last half hour in my mind. I had come home from work to find my wife, Peggy, sitting at the kitchen table with a full glass of wine in front of her. I knew something was up as soon as I saw her there. First, she was home before me, and she never got home from work until a half hour to an hour after I did. Secondly, the understanding we had was that the first one home would start dinner, and there was nothing on the stove. Lastly, there was the glass of wine. Peg rarely drank. I was no sooner in the room than she asked me to sit down and told me she had something to say. I grabbed a beer from the fridge, sat down across from her, and she said, Rob, I know you know this, but there has been something out of sync between us for the last six months or so. I have no idea why we seem to be moving away from each other. I don't know if it's something to do with me or something to do with you, but something is wrong. I've tried to talk with you about it, but all I get from you is that we are just going through a rough patch and it will get better. I've decided that we need to separate. I'm not talking divorce, just a separation for a while. I think I need some space, Rob. I need to get away, look at my life, and see if I can figure out where the disconnect between us is coming from. You can use the time we are apart to look at the same thing from your angle. Oh, come on, Peg, it isn't that bad. Sure, we are having some problems, what marriage doesn't? But two people can't work out problems if they're away from each other and not talking. Talking isn't going to help, Rob. You only see one problem with our marriage. As far as you're concerned, the only problem we have is that we aren't making love. Your solution to the problem is for me to get naked and let you have your way with me. As far as I'm concerned, there is a lot more wrong. We don't make love anymore because I don't want to. We don't snuggle or cuddle anymore because I don't want you touching me, and I don't know why I don't want you to touch me. I still love you. I love you as much as I did on the day we were married, but something is wrong and I don't know what it is. I need some space, Rob. I need some time alone so I can figure things out. So you want to pitch ten years of marriage out the window? No, Rob. I just think we need to spend some time apart. I've already packed my stuff in my car. I'm going to stay with my sister until I can find a place. I'll call you once a week to keep in touch. She stood up and said, I have to go. I told Mary that I'd be there by seven. She turned and walked away without even offering to kiss me goodbye, and that in itself told me where I stood. It didn't take long for the word to get around that Peggy and I had separated. Most of our friends were sympathetic and went out of their way to try and cheer me up. Peggy called me once a week and asked how I was, and I would say I was managing. Then I'd ask her how she was, and she would say that she was okay. I would then ask if she was ready to come home yet, and she would tell me not yet. Peg had been gone for six weeks when I started hearing disturbing things, things like she had a live-in boyfriend. I didn't want to believe it. I wanted to believe that things were as she said they were, that she just wanted some time alone to get her head straight and then would be coming home. I kept hearing things, so I decided to check out the rumors. I'd find out where Peg was staying, do a little snooping, and put the rumors to rest. But no one could tell me where she was staying, either they couldn't or wouldn't, and I began to think that something about the situation stunk to high heaven. I was having dinner with my friend Tom and his wife Tanya, and I voiced my concerns, letting slip that I was going to hire a private detective to find Peg and either confirm the rumors or disprove them. I saw Tom look at Tanya and I saw her give him a little nod. Save your money, Rob, Tom said. The rumors are true. Most of the people who know you know what is going on, but they like you too much to tell you. Tell me what? That Peggy left you to live with Adam White. Adam White? Who the hell is Adam White? I've never heard of him. He works with Peggy, and she just up and left me to go live with him? That doesn't make sense. If she was going to do that, why didn't she just divorce me? What's with the separation? You know Peg, Rob. She plans, makes fallback plans, and then makes plans for if the fallback plan doesn't work. 
She's been seeing White for almost a year, and I'm guessing she did this separation thing so she could come home if living with White wasn't as good as having an affair with him. And everyone knows this but no one would tell me. Gee, what a great bunch of friends I have. I stood up, threw my napkin down in the center of the table, and said, thanks a bunch. I'll see myself out. I left their house. On the drive home, I thought about what I had just learned. No sex with Peg for over a year because she didn't want to make love with me. No snuggling for over a year because she didn't want me touching her. And all the time she was having an affair, I sat at home like a fool, behaving myself while I waited for the unfaithful 304 to come home. And all my friends, my wonderful friends, knew all about it and just let me sit there, staring at the walls and waiting. Well, the waiting was over. The next morning, I made an appointment with the Corliss Investigative Agency and gave them a retainer. I told them where Peg and this white guy worked and asked for all the dirt they could get on the two. Then I went home and started making a list of everything I needed to do to sever my relationship with Peg. I'd wait until I had the report from the detective agency, but when I got it, I would have my list and be ready. Once the list was made, I sat back and thought about something else I needed to do. I hadn't been late in almost 16 months, with Peg denying me for a year and then the separation. I had been a completely faithful husband, but now that I knew what Peg was doing, I damn sure wasn't going to remain celibate any longer. I sat at the kitchen table, sipping a beer and making plans to end my long dry spell when I remembered what Tom had said about Peg. She plans everything. After living with her as long as I had, I knew that was true. To me, that meant she had plans for what to do if I found out about what she was doing, plans based on how she thought I would respond to finding out. And the biggest plan of all, how to stick it to me if she decided that living with White was what she really wanted to do. I could see her having me watched so that if I went out and strayed, she would be able to use it against me in a divorce. All of a sudden, the list I had made seemed worthless because she might have planned for my reaction that way. It was back to the drawing board, and a new list took shape. As it took shape, I saw that a lot of what I wanted to do would have to be done right away, not left until the last minute. There were also some things I could do that would stick it to Peg and make her suffer. I smiled at the thought and wondered if she had a plan for when something like that happened to her. The next morning, I went to my bank to deposit my paycheck. While I was there, I checked on the safe deposit box Peg and I had. I saw from the sign and log that Peg seemed to check the box at least once a week. When I saw that, I knew she was keeping track of me, and that at the first sign that I was onto her, she would pounce. I thought about that for a minute, then took the five certificates of deposit from their plastic envelopes, went upstairs, and used the bank's copy machine to copy all five. I then put the copies back in their envelopes and returned them to the box. Unless Peg took the CDs out of the envelopes to check them, she would never know about the switch. Since I knew Peg was checking up on me, I took my passport from the box and casually mentioned to the woman from the bank, as she put the box back in its slot, that I was going down to Mexico on a fishing trip. I left the bank with the five CDs in my pocket. I normally went to the bank twice a week on average, and each visit, I would cash in one CD, pay the early withdrawal penalty, and then hide the cash away. When I got home, I wasn't a believer in credit cards. I thought you could get in trouble too easily with them, so the only ones I had in my name were an American Express card, on which the full balance had to be paid when you got the bill, several gasoline company credit cards, and one Visa card with a low limit that was in my name only. Peg, on the other hand, had a good half dozen credit cards in just her name, and some of them had high limits. I knew what the limits were because I paid the bills every month. I made a list of the remaining account balances and set it aside. I would make sure to pay the minimum payment on those cards to keep them in good standing. I sat down and made a list of all the things I would like to have. Over the course of the next couple of weeks, I went on a spending binge using Peg's credit cards. When I bailed, she would be saddled with the credit card debt, and I intended to make it considerable. I updated my computer, got a new Dell with all the bells and whistles, bought a Remington 700 on eBay and a bunch of other stuff like a digital camera and a state-of-the-art cell phone that did everything but cook my dinner. The house was Peg's, it had been left to her by her parents, so I would have no claim on it. However, we had used it as collateral for an open line of credit when we put in the swimming pool and hot tub, and both of our signatures were on the account. We had paid off what we had borrowed, but the line of credit was still open. If I timed it right, 
I could draw on that line before she knew what I was doing. I had wondered why, when she decided we needed a trial separation, she packed up and left me in her house instead of asking me to leave. Now I knew. If I was still in the house, I would obviously be expecting her to come back and see this separation as something that wasn't going to last. Next, I closed out my 401k at work, paid the penalty, and squirreled away the cash. Then I sat back and waited for the private detective's report. The one thing I couldn't figure out how to do was get my ashes hauled. I couldn't take the chance that Peg had someone watching me to see if I went looking. I decided what I would have to do was leave town on the weekends to go on fishing trips. She knew that I loved to fish and went quite often, and she knew from the catches I brought home that I actually went fishing, so I doubted she would pay a private detective to follow me. No need for her to get too carried away. After all, wasn't I stupid? Hadn't she been pulling the wool over my eyes for over a year? It was a Friday, and I was just getting ready to leave work when I got a phone call from Tanya asking me to stop by their house on the way home. I tried to beg off, but she told me it was important, so even though I really didn't want to go there, I said I would. When I got there, she let me in and led me into the living room, where I found Tom sitting in an easy chair. He got up, offered me his hand, and I shook it. Then he told me to sit down and get comfortable while he got me a beer. Tanya needs to talk with you, Rob, and you need to know that I'm 100% on board with what she's going to say, he said. He left the room and headed for the kitchen while I gave Tanya a questioning look. She said, in a minute, Rob, you're going to need some beer for this. Tom came back, handed me a Bud Light, and said, I've got some errands to run and probably won't be back before midnight. Catch you later. He headed for the front door, and I heard it open and then close behind him. The door closing was Tanya's signal to start talking. Rob, you heard us when you stormed out of here the night you were here for dinner, she began. I started to say something, but she held up her hand and said, let me finish. You were justified, but it still hurt. In our defense, all I can say is that we like you a lot and didn't want to be the ones to hurt you. It gets a little complicated in that we are friends with Peg also, and we were hoping she would get her head on straight and go home to you where she belongs. We know you love her, or at least you did love her, but we didn't know if it was enough for you to forgive her, so we kept quiet. If you got back together and didn't know, you could have gotten on with your lives without having to worry about forgiving and forgetting. That's it, that's our apology. But that is only part of why Tom and I wanted you to stop by. We know you, Rob, and we know what kind of guy you are. You would no more cheat on your wife than you would rob a bank. How long has it been since you had sex? The question caught me totally off guard. For the first time, I noticed how Tanya was dressed, a low-cut blouse that showed off her ample cleavage, a short skirt, and high heels that showcased her marvelous legs. Friend or no friend, I couldn't help but get an erection. Then I remembered Tom's I'm 100% on board comment, and I had an idea where things were going. In a subdued voice, I told her that it had been a year and a half. She leaned toward me, giving me a look down inside her blouse, and huskily said, I'd like to change that, Rob. Tom's my friend, Tanya. I can't do that to him. I started to get up, but she grabbed my arm and pulled me back down. Tom's okay with this, Rob. That's why he left, to give us some time alone. This isn't pity sex. Tom and I have talked this over for months now. You have something we want, so hopefully I can help you, and you can help us. I don't understand what you're saying, I said, bluntly. To be blunt about it, Rob, she continued, Tom is sterile, and we want a child. We want you to give me one. I was stunned. I sat there and stared at her, speechless. When I finally did find my voice, I said, you just said that you knew I wouldn't cheat on Peg. Yes, she said, as she laid a hand on the lump in my trousers. But that was before you knew what Peg was doing. Now that you know, you're released from your vows to her. Why me? We wanted to be with someone we know, not some anonymous sperm donor. We also want you to be part of the child's life. You will be the godfather and will always be around as Uncle Rob. This doesn't make any sense, I said. Of course it does. What if something happens to Tom and me? Who better to take care of the child than Uncle Rob? On the flip side, God forbid, what if the child needed a liver transplant or something like that? Could we find the anonymous sperm donor? And even if we did, 
Would he help? If we got on a waiting list, how long would we have to wait to find a donor who would be a match? No, Rob, we thought it through. We want you to be a part of our family. On the other hand, are you going to tell me that you don't find me sexy? Tanya asked, looking at me and starting to touch me. This says you do. She pulled me close and added, There are benefits to being the father of my child, Rob. We will have to make love many, many times to make sure that I get pregnant. I won't limit you to just the days I'm most fertile. In fact, I won't even tell you when they are. It could take weeks, Rob, weeks and weeks. And you've been without for how long? We will help each other, she said as her lips closed around my neck. It had been a long time for me, and I knew I wasn't going to last long. Now we can go into the bedroom and do some serious baby making, Tanya said. All my reservations about what was happening disappeared when she gave me a blowjob, so I got up and followed her into the bedroom. I thought about what had just happened all the way home. As I pulled into the driveway, it occurred to me that if Peg was having me watched, she would find out about my visits to Tom and Tanya and notice that Tom left, but I stayed for several hours. The next morning, I called Tanya and explained my thoughts to her. She told me not to worry, that no one would see Tom leave because he didn't. He went down to his basement workshop and stayed there until I left. That information gave me peace. It was one thing to make love to Tanya when Tom was gone, but could I do it if I knew he was in the house? Tanya must have known what I was thinking because she said, Don't worry, Rob. It will be okay. I promise. That afternoon, I got a call from Tom asking me to have a drink with him after work. Talk about awkward. Try sitting down with a guy you've known for 20 years, who is a good friend and whose wife you've just slept with, all with his knowledge. He must have known what I was thinking, so he cut right to it. I know this is awkward for you, Rob. Hell, buddy, it's awkward for me, too. But I have to talk with you about the situation we're in. First off, and I told you this when I left you and Tanya alone, I am 100% okay with it. I mean that, Rob. But that said, I have to tell you that Tanya didn't tell you the full truth. I know she told you about wanting a child and about me being sterile, but I also know that she didn't tell you the rest of it. To be blunt about it, buddy, I can't get it up. I haven't been able to make love to Tanya in over a year. My God, I said. That was why she was so hot last night. She was playing catch up, and her telling me that she didn't want to give Tom sloppy seconds was her way of covering for his impotence. She didn't want me to think less of him as a man, not that I would have but she didn't know that. What a difference between her and Peg. Tanya put Tom first, even in difficult circumstances, while Peg thought only of herself. I don't know if it came through to you last night, Tom continued, but Tanya is an extremely sexual person. My not being able to perform was driving her up the wall. She has tried hard to hold it together, Rob, but sooner or later, she was going to cheat on me. I know that seems harsh, but that's what would happen. I know she loves me and would do her best to hide her cheating from me, but I would know. How could I not? If she got laid, she wouldn't be climbing the walls anymore, and I would notice. I love her, Rob. The woman is my life. If I didn't have her, I would just die. And that's the problem. If she snuck off and cheated behind my back, I couldn't live with her. I would understand why she did it, but I couldn't live with the dishonesty of it. The only solution, at least as far as I could see, was to make it happen out in the open. But Tanya isn't the kind of woman who would agree to taking a lover and going into the bedroom while I sat in the living room and watched TV while she screwed. She could probably have done it with a stranger in a motel room with me not knowing, but she couldn't just do a guy with me knowing and then a different guy the following week and another the week after that. What we needed was someone steady, someone we both liked and were comfortable with. We sat down and made a list of possible candidates but couldn't agree on anyone. We kept coming back to you, but we were afraid that if we started with you and then Peg came back home, it would stop and we would have to start over. Peg would eventually come back to you. Everyone who knows Adam White knows that he's an a-hole, and Peg would soon find out and go home to you, secure in the knowledge that you had no idea what she had been doing. I have no idea why she thinks you were that dumb. I can only guess that she thinks you love her so much that the thought would never occur to you that she might be up to something. I had a chuckle at that. She pretty much read me right because that's exactly how it went. 
it was only because the separation was dragging on and on that I finally realized something wasn't right. Well, you do know now, and I know even if Peg doesn't, that now that you do know, she is history. I know you won't take her back under any conditions. That freed Tanya and me up so that we could approach you. Tanya and I want a child, Rob, and Tanya needs a steady sex life. Until the doctors can find and fix my problem, someone else is going to have to provide that sex life for her. I know it sounds silly to say this, but you making love to my wife is going to save my marriage. You just have to get comfortable with the idea that I know and that I'm alright with it. I didn't know what to say. The whole thing was so off the wall that even though it had already happened once, I was still having trouble believing it. Tom stared down into his drink, then looked up at me and said, It kills me not to be able to take care of my wife, Rob, but it would kill me if I lost her. I need you to do this for me, bud. I really do. Can I count on you? I stared at him for a few seconds and then nodded my head in agreement. On Sunday, I had Tom, Tanya, and three other couples over for a barbecue. When the other couples had gone, Tom went into the den and played on my computer while Tanya and I went up to my bedroom. By the time I was undressed, Tanya was lying on the bed, imploring me to hurry. It was my house, Tanya, and on my bed, we do it my way. I kept her legs up on my shoulders so gravity would help my little guys in their race to her egg. After maybe 30 seconds, I told her to put a pillow under her hips, and then I let her legs down. Tanya looked up at me and said, Peg walked away from this? The woman must be crazy or stupid. With that stroke to my ego, I just had to justify it, so I swung over her in a missionary position. As she said, No, Rob, I needed to do its job, I laughed and said, If any is still there around the opening, it isn't going anywhere anyway. Five minutes later, I was driving deep into her for the second time. I saw that Tom knew what he was talking about when he said Tanya was a very sexual person. She got a third time out of me before I walked her and Tom to their car. Tom shook my hand, and Tanya kissed me on the cheek. We all agreed that the day had been a success and that we should do it again sometime soon. Anyone watching would assume we were talking about the barbecue. On Monday afternoon, I met with John Abbott from the Corliss Agency. As he handed me the report, he said, I'm sorry. Every time I do one of these things, I hope it's all a simple misunderstanding and that nothing is going on. But there is no doubt here. Your fee also covers our court appearance on your behalf if what you decide to do goes to trial. I shook his hand and left his office. On the drive home, I wasn't nearly as enraged as I thought I would be. It was probably because I had already accepted that it was true, and by the time I got the report, I had settled everything in my mind. What was I going to do about the situation? Nothing that I had not already done. The only thing left for me to do was time the draw on the house line of credit so Peg wouldn't know about it until it was too late. I would see an attorney and get the papers drawn up, but I would hold off on having them served until I was ready. For the next five weeks, I saw Tom and Tanya three or four times a week, either at their house or mine. They let it slip that I was going through a rough patch and that they were spending time with me to cheer me up. I got my weekly phone call from Peg, but I stopped asking her how she was and when she would be coming home. Finally, I'd had enough. I wrote checks against the line of credit, and as soon as they cleared, I found an apartment, moved out of the house, and had Peg served with divorce papers. I cited irreconcilable differences instead of adultery, so Peg wouldn't know that I knew about Adam White. She would see it as my way of trying to push her into deciding to come home. She would call me, feed me a line about how I was overreacting, and then probably suggest that we meet someplace for a drink and dinner where she would try to calm me down and talk some sense into me. I would agree to meet her, listen to her, and then tell her I would think about it. It would buy me several days for the line of credit checks to clear and for me to clean out the checking and savings accounts. It went just as I thought it would. First, the phone call telling me I was being unreasonable and that there was no need for me to get attorneys involved. I told her I was tired of the neither fish nor fowl situation. You don't want to be with me, so it's time for me to accept it and move on with my life. I agreed to meet her at Angelo's. It was the first time I'd seen her since she walked out on me, and she looked good. I was going to miss her, strike that, I did miss her. It was obvious to me that I still loved her, but even if she came back to me, I knew there was no way I could ever live with her again. I didn't tell her that, though. Instead, 
I sat there and listened to her feed me a line about seeing an analyst, helping Peg understand, blah blah blah, and that Peg was making good progress and just needed a little more time. I know it is hard on you, baby, but it's just as hard on me. Please, baby, just a little more time. I told her I would think about it and let her know. I waited two days and then called my attorney, telling him it was time to move to step two. He withdrew the divorce papers and sent Peg a notice that the filing had been cancelled. I got a call from Peg at work, thanking me and telling me that I wouldn't regret it. I smiled, knowing that I didn't regret it but that she didn't know why. She would soon find out. That night, I had dinner at Tom and Tanya's, and after dinner, Tanya and I retired to her bedroom. As Tanya spread herself for me, she said, Can we make love tonight instead of just screwing? I'd like to make love to the father of my child. I asked if she was sure. Positive. The home test told me Tuesday, and the doctor confirmed it this afternoon. You're going to be a daddy. We only did it once that night, but it was a long, slow, and very satisfying session. When it was over, I told her it might be a while before I saw her again. I'm going to end the farce with Peg and White this week, and I may have to leave town for a while. Don't do anything too drastic, lover. I'm going to need the father of my baby to be around. That would be Tom. Sweetie, you need to start thinking like that. You know what I mean, lover. Just because I'm pregnant doesn't mean I'm not going to need you anymore. Adam White was a member of the Fraternal Order of Eagles, and since he had been elected sergeant at arms, he had never missed a meeting. He left Wednesday's meeting in a good mood, after talking to several influential members, he believed he had a shot if he ran for a higher office in the order. He was still in that good mood when he got out of his car in the parking lot of his condo. He locked his car door, turned, and felt a blinding pain before everything turned black. He was found by a neighbor who called 911. The paramedics who responded rushed him to the emergency room, where it was discovered that both of his arms and legs had been broken, and there was damage to his genital area so severe that both of his testicles had to be removed. He was in great pain when he opened his eyes and saw he was in a hospital room, unable to move. He had casts on his arms and legs and was in traction. He saw Peggy standing next to his bed with a horrified expression on her face before he faded out again. I wasn't there when it happened, of course, but I received a full description of what occurred. When the man walked into the room, he approached Peg, who was standing next to the bed and looking down at White. The man asked her if she was Margaret Olson, and when she said yes, he handed her some papers and told her she had been served. She looked confused as she opened the envelope and saw that she was being sued for divorce this time on the grounds of infidelity. She looked at the word infidelity and then at the wreck lying on the bed in front of her. Her face lost all its color and took on a horrified expression as she understood what it meant. She moaned, oh my god, then sat down in a chair and started crying. I stuck around long enough for the police to ask me where I was that night. It turns out that I was at a poker game that started an hour before the Eagles meeting and lasted until an hour after White was admitted to the hospital. Peg paid for my alibi, although she didn't know it. The guys were on my side and would have done it for free, but the object was to stick it to Peg, so I used her credit to show my appreciation. Home Shopping Network charged her Visa card for the digital cameras I gave to Bill and Steve. eBay charged her MasterCard for the laptop I gave to Mike and the 19-inch flat-screen monitor I gave to Phil. She even paid for the aluminum baseball bat. I had six weeks of vacation and three weeks of comp time coming to me, so I took a two-month leave of absence in conjunction with that time. When the police were satisfied that I had nothing to do with White's misfortune that they could prove, I made arrangements to leave town and take a fishing trip in Mexico. Before I left, I told my attorney not to push the divorce and just let it sit until Peg started fighting it, then to drop it. We would stay married, but I would have nothing to do with her. I called Tom and Tanya once a week to see how things were going. They told me Peg had moved back into the house and, as far as anyone could tell, true love must not have been in the cards for Peg in white, because she never went back to visit him after the day she was served while standing next to his hospital bed. The maxed out credit card bills must have started hitting the mailbox, and she must have found out that the savings and checking accounts were dry. The line of credit was tapped out, and the CDs in the bank deposit box were fake. The next word I got was that Peg was frantically trying to find me, and no one could tell her where I was. 
My boss, who knew the full story, told her I was gone when she called and was trying to find me. He told her that I just came in one day, said I was leaving, and asked for my check. Basically, he led her to believe that I had quit without notice. He didn't tell her that, but he did lead her to believe it. A call to my attorney demanding that he set up a meeting with me got her the information that I had dropped the divorce action, paid him off, and that he no longer represented me. She had no choice. For months after I had left on my fishing trip, she filed for bankruptcy. She ended up losing the house and had to give up her Lexus and start driving a used Geo. Once I heard that, I came back from Mexico, got an apartment on the other side of town from where Peg lived, and did my best to stay away from places where she might see me. Tanya was five months pregnant and looking sexier than any woman had a right to look. We picked up where we left off. This time, though, we didn't have to worry about whether someone was keeping tabs on me. Two or three times a week, she spent the night at my place or I spent the night at hers. I was back for two months before Peg found out. One day, when I got off work, I found her waiting in the parking lot for me. She got out of her car and headed toward me, but I ignored her, got in my car, and pulled out of the lot. In the rearview mirror, I saw her hurry to her car, and I slowed down so she could keep me in sight. I'd have it out with her, but not in the parking lot at work. I kept my speed where she would have no trouble following me. About ten minutes later, I pulled into the lot at Bud's Bar and Grill. I was inside by the time she got parked, and I was sitting at the bar ordering a Bud Light when she came in, looked around, saw me, and headed toward me. She was already mouthing off as she approached. Don't think you can run from me, you scum sucker. I knew Peg, so I knew what she would do. I spun around on the stool and caught her wrist as she swung at my head. I squeezed as hard as I could, and she gasped in pain as I said, I have every reason in the world to want to hurt you, Peg, so it's best you don't push me too far. You keep your hands to yourself unless you want to feel some real pain. I let go of her wrist and said, I wasn't running from you. I drove nice and slow so you could follow me here. I wasn't going to air your dirty laundry in the parking lot where I work. It doesn't matter here because everyone here already knows you're a 304. I want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. I've already listened to enough of your lies. I want my money back. What money would that be, Peg? You owe me the money you took out against the house and half of everything else we had. It was mine, and I want it. Well, you're not going to get it, Peg. My position on the matter is that it was restitution for what you did to me. What is it the lawyers say when they sue? Compensation for pain and suffering and loss of conjugal rights. I figure what I got just about covers the pain and suffering I went through for going without sex for a year and a half while you were giving it away to someone else and for the humiliation I suffered as everyone I knew looked on me as stupid. Damn you, Rob. I lost my parents' home because of you. Big deal, Peg. It couldn't have meant all that much to you since, as I recall, you moved out to shack up with another man. I mean it, Rob. I want that money. Here's a news flash for you, Peggy. You will never get a dime of it from me. You tried to screw me over, and you got caught. I made you pay, live with it. I guess we'll just have to see what the courts say. It doesn't matter what they say, Peg. Here's the way it will work. You will have to get a lawyer and sue me for divorce to get me into court so the court can issue an order for the division of assets. As soon as you sue, I will counter sue. A good lawyer can stall things for six to eight months, and during that time, you will be paying your lawyer. Can you afford to pay him to get nothing? I have all the evidence I need to fight you in court, and if I win, you will take it in the rear. Worst case scenario for me is that I'm ordered to split the assets. I'll say okay, judge, and leave the court. You and your lawyer will wait and wait for the money, but the money will never come. You'll call me, but I won't take your calls. So your lawyer, who you're still paying, will go back to court and get a court order telling me to pay by a certain time. You and the lawyer will wait and wait, and when the deadline arrives, you still won't have received a dime from me. Your lawyer, still billing you for his time, will go back to court and get a judgment against me. I have no savings or checking accounts that can be attached. My car is a lease, so nothing for you there. I live in a furnished apartment, so there isn't anything there you can get. All you can do with your judgment is garnish my wages. The first time my paycheck is garnished, I'll quit my job. 
So, what do we have here, Peg? A good year's worth of lawyer's fees out of your pocket, all for maybe $200 out of one paycheck. All that's left for you to try is to go back to the judge and get him to threaten me with jail for contempt of court if I don't comply with his orders. All that will get you, Peg, is a postcard for me from some small fishing village in Mexico where I will take up residence until my money runs out. And I've got a lot, Peg, thanks to you. Face it, Peggy. You screwed me over, got caught, and I got even. Consider yourself fortunate. Think about what happened to your boyfriend and consider yourself very fortunate. He lost his balls and now he can never screw with another man's wife. You, on the other hand, can still spread for anyone you want. I knew it. I knew you had something to do with what happened to Adam. What you think you know and what you can prove are two very different things, Peggy. By the way, how are things going with your love affair? From what I hear, you haven't seen the poor man since his first day in the hospital. What would be the point? You took away the only thing he had going for him. Oh, that's cold, Peg, even for you. It's the truth. He was extremely well endowed and a marvelous lover, but I would have tired of him eventually and come home. Oh, Peg, if only I had known. All the unpleasantness could have been avoided if I had known that someday you would have come home to me. Oh, damn. I guess by my actions I messed that up, didn't I? I'll have to carry that regret to my grave. Oh, what a joy life could have been if we had only communicated better. You can be such an a-hole. Yes, Peg, and you're a worthless cheating 304. I finished my beer, got up, and said, have a rotten life, Peg, and I left the bar. Three days later, I was served with divorce papers citing irreconcilable differences. I didn't contest it, and she was awarded half of the marital assets. I was ordered to pay her the money borrowed against the line of credit. I wished her luck in getting anything and tossed the final decree in the trash. She must have believed me when I told her how things would go, because I never heard from her again. One interesting thing came out of the mess. Everyone agreed that White was a dipshit, but even dipshits can have a friend or two, and one of White's was Peggy's boss. He wasn't happy with the way she treated White after his misfortune, and he fired her. Well, fired isn't quite the way it was put. A downturn in the economy necessitated downsizing, and Peggy was let go. But everyone knew she was fired. She couldn't find work in our area, so she relocated to California where she had some relatives. No one, not even her sister, has heard from her since. There is one more chapter to the story. It was a sad ending but, at the same time, a glorious beginning. Tanya had a beautiful baby girl and Tom doted on her and spoiled her rotten. Uncle Rob was a constant visitor and spent many, many hours crawling around on the floor with little Martha. Tom never told Tanya or me the full story. He knew why he had erectile dysfunction, but he hid it from Tanya. He had cancer and it didn't get caught in time. The cancer spread and following his funeral, Tanya handed me an envelope addressed to me. Written across the front of the envelope were the words for Rob's eyes only. I looked at her, and she shrugged and said, I have no idea. It is addressed to you, so I haven't seen what's inside. I opened it and read, Hey bud, if you're reading this, I'm gone. There was a reason I picked you. Yes, it was me, not Tanya, who was the father of our child. I knew I wouldn't be there for them, and I wanted someone I trusted to watch over them. I knew I could count on you, so you got elected. Don't let me down, bud. Take good care of our girls. I handed the letter to Tanya, and she read it and started crying. I took her in my arms to comfort her, and when she had cried herself out, she asked me what I was going to do. I'm going to do just what he knew I would do. I'm going to take care of my girls. Six months later, Tanya and I were married. Story 2 Angela and I lived in a spacious two-story house with a small pool in the backyard. We moved there after getting married, and a couple of years later, our son Eric was born, followed by our daughter Samantha. I worked as a manager in a prestigious company, wanting to provide everything for my family so that none of them lacked anything. Angela stayed at home for a while when the kids were little, engaging in making small clay figurines alongside her household chores. It had been her hobby for a long time, and when she had accumulated enough figurines, she organized unique sales events. Years passed. 
Eric and Samantha grew up and went to college. By then, I was able to provide each of them with good phones and laptops. Eric got a computer first as he was growing up, and since then, he became passionate about the field. He pursued studies as a programmer, despite having acquired considerable skills already. He didn't intend to stop and chose a career in IT. On the other hand, Samantha was more into fashion and enjoyed creating her own designs. So, she chose a career as a fashion designer. Besides, she was as beautiful as her mother, and by the time she finished school, several agencies offered her modeling jobs after seeing her photos on her blog. Like fledglings at a certain age, the kids left their nest, and while we rejoiced in seeing what wonderful individuals they had become, we continued living for ourselves. It feels empty now, Angela said one day, sitting with me in the living room. What? I didn't quite catch it at first. Yes, now that the kids have moved away, it's noticeably quieter. I got so used to them always being at home. Even when they were being silly, which sometimes annoyed me, now I miss even that. You're right. The house is indeed much quieter now. But they can't always be with us. Besides, we're not at the age to handle daily chaos. By the way, Mark called and said they'll drop by tomorrow. Really? But you were planning to work in the garage. My wife recalled my plans. Yes, I was. But they've decided to throw a party for Mark's birthday. And they couldn't finish their renovation on time. So, Mark intends to talk to us about arranging the celebration at our place. What? Angela asked in surprise. Well, he asked not to mention it for now. He wants to discuss it in person. What's wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong in them celebrating here. We have enough space. It'll be enough for them and the guests. It'll help break the monotony a bit. I'm glad you agreed. I kissed my wife on the cheek and hugged her tenderly. In my heart, I was happy I wouldn't have to argue with her about it since I had already promised Mark that our house would be at his disposal for the celebration. Mark and Monique Rells had been our longtime family friends. I became close friends with Mark back when we served in the army. He often visited us, first alone, and then he married a wonderful girl and they started visiting us together. We tried to celebrate various holidays together, sometimes at our place, sometimes at theirs, or just gathering with our families outdoors. Our kids also became friends and often played together. Unlike our family, Mark and Monique didn't have that emotional abundance and tranquility. I already knew them well, both of them had a wind-up personality, and their tastes and hobbies differed in many ways. Sometimes, I even wondered why they got together and married. But Mark told me they loved each other, at least initially. Besides, they had passionate relations in bed and occasionally engaged in role-playing, these amusements they carried with them through the years they lived, and even now engaged in it. However, beyond their romantic feelings, they frequently argued, sometimes over trivial matters. Most of the time, it was sparked by Monique, who was very jealous of her husband. But it wasn't without reason. Mark was handsome and, especially when he had a few drinks, tended to check out other women. He even had a few affairs, which he boasted about to me in secret. Monique somehow found out about these, leading to scenes. Once, it almost led to divorce. But primarily for the children's sake, they stayed together. After finishing the conversation with my wife, Mark called me. Peter, are you free right now? He asked. Well, not tied up with anything important. Why? I'd like to meet up with you. But you're coming over tomorrow anyway. Tomorrow's tomorrow. And I won't be alone, I'll have my wife with me. I wanted to chat with you without the company of women. All right. Where shall we meet? Mark suggested meeting in an hour at the bar, which recently became our favorite spot for guys' hangouts and chats. I got delayed a bit. And when I arrived, I noticed that my friend was almost drooling in the direction of the waitress who was serving him. 
and I understood him, as a man, because she was of quite lush body shapes, and her uniform was definitely not strict. Then Mark noticed me, waved, and I joined him, sitting down across from him. What's up with you? I asked. With me? Nothing new. Just thought of dragging you out to chill. Mark, your voice sounded a bit troubled on the phone. I even thought something had happened. I had another fight with Monique. Tell me, bro, how do you manage to live so peacefully with Angela? How did you raise her not to create scenes over every little thing? Did Monique catch you with someone again? I didn't directly answer his question. Huh? No. But you know her. She's jealous even of my bed. Mark, you're my friend. But honestly, there's fault on your side too. I've known you for years. I know you're quite the ladies' man. Maybe you shouldn't have rushed into marriage so soon? Ugh. Why bring that up now? What about you? How do you get along so well with your wife? I thought you understood. I've never cheated on her and never gave her a reason to suspect anything. How about that stripper? Forgot about that after all these years? Mark smirked, trying to tease me. That was years ago, at your bachelor party. And there was nothing significant. She just danced near me. Besides, I confessed everything to Angela. I didn't want any misunderstandings between us because of that. And then? Did she just forgive you easily? No drama? Well, she was upset at first, of course. But soon, she calmed down and even confessed that her bachelorette party also had a stripper. What? Mark was shocked. So Monique blames me, yet she. And you just accepted her confession calmly? His emotions were escalating, and I sensed he wasn't telling me something. Hey, buddy, calm down. Why are you so worked up? You both had similar nights. You're not exactly a saint yourself. But she never told me. She said it was just the girls there. What a whore. I didn't understand why my friend was so annoyed. Even though I knew Mark always believed that as a man, he was always right about everything, even when he wasn't. We spent some time debating on this topic, with me having to listen more to his complaints about his unfortunate fate. When I got home, I noticed my wife looked somewhat unwell, visibly agitated. Something happened? I asked, genuinely concerned. No. Why do you ask? Angela tried to hide her distress. You don't look okay. Are you sure everything's alright? Yeah. Just a bit of a headache. She asked me what Mark wanted, and I said it was just a regular guy's hangout. I almost forgot how he whined and focused his attention on my wife. My attention was more on Angela now, though she later claimed that nothing was wrong with her. However, in the evening, when we were getting ready for bed, I naturally wanted intimacy with my wife. But she refused, saying her headache hadn't passed. So, I just lay there, feeling like she was lost in her own thoughts. The next day, our friends came over as planned. Monica immediately started gossiping with Angela, although she wasn't in the mood for conversation. Before their arrival, I noticed a couple of times that she wasn't feeling too well, and she honestly admitted to occasionally feeling lightheaded. As we prepared for the celebration, each of them voiced their ideas. Monica wanted everything to be perfect, she wished for the celebration to be outstanding. Mark didn't want too many guests, he wanted only close friends for his birthday and wished for more alcohol and meat in the menu. Monica had to compromise with his choice. After all, it was his celebration. As we gathered around the table and discussed the upcoming celebration, I tried not to take my eyes off my wife. At the same time, chatting with friends, I couldn't help but notice how Mark occasionally threw explicit glances at Angela. And I even felt jealousy slowly creeping into my soul. I remembered an unpleasant event that happened many years ago. Shortly after our wedding, 
I found out that Angela got so drunk at one of the parties that she ended up in bed with Mark. I was furious with both of them. Very furious. I was ready to tear them apart. But then, someone came into my life who influenced me not to commit a terrible act. But she not only didn't apologize to me, she didn't even confess to it. Apparently, she was sure I knew nothing because she didn't notice that I saw them and decided to keep it a secret. These memories and the chatter of friends distracted me, and when I glanced at Angela, I saw her suddenly turn pale, then her eyes rolled back, and she, dropping the coffee cup, lost consciousness. I was frightened for her and immediately rushed to her side. Angela, what's wrong? Angela, wake up, sweetheart. I quickly grabbed my phone and dialed emergency services. Mark and Monica looked alarmed too. They didn't understand what was happening but were worried about their friend. Angela woke up on the way to the hospital. I sat by her side, wearing a worried expression, holding her hand. Seeing her regain consciousness brought me some relief. The doctor, who was also present, immediately started examining her. What happened? Where am I? Angela looked around. You fainted. We're going to the hospital. The doctor will check you. But so far, they said there's nothing serious. Ma'am, how are you feeling? The doctor asked. But Angela didn't respond. And after driving for some more time, Angela began to protest. Peter, I'm feeling much better already. We don't have to go to the hospital. You know how much I dislike them. Sweetheart, I'm glad you're feeling better. But let the doctor check you anyway. You're not that young anymore. Think about your health. It's not entirely normal that you blacked out so suddenly, I pleaded with her. Realizing that it would be impossible to persuade me and the doctor, Angela accepted it. While she was being examined and tests were being taken, I was busy filling out the necessary forms that the nurse handed me. A little later, Monique called me and asked about Angela's health. She's better. Thanks for asking, I replied. Thank goodness. We were so worried. Mark is going crazy too. I think he's worried that because of this, we won't be able to have the celebration at your place. Is that all he's worried about? I asked, surprised and dismayed. No, no, that's not what I meant. All right, Monica. The doctor is calling me, I interrupted. I hung up and headed towards the doctor, hoping to hear that my wife was just experiencing a blood pressure fluctuation, maybe due to the weather or just age. But when the doctor voiced their suspicions, my expression changed drastically, and my worry for my wife's health intensified several times over. Are you sure, doctor? I cannot definitively confirm that yet. More tests need to be done. We have to wait for the results of the analyses. But the preliminary examination indicates that your wife has cancer. How could this happen? Why is this happening to her? I asked, bewildered. I'm sorry. But that's all I can tell you for now. The doctor looked at me sympathetically and went about their duties. At first, I stood in the corridor for a while, not understanding why this was happening to my wife and what she did to deserve such a fate. After all, we were always a model family, attending church, sometimes even involved in charitable activities. I decided not to tell our friends anything for now. But I needed to discuss this with my wife, so I headed to her ward. She lay there on the bed, still a bit pale after having her blood drawn for analysis. She couldn't stand the sight of blood, and even though she turned away during the procedure, she noticed her own blood in the syringe, which made her very uncomfortable. How are you? I asked, approaching her. It's like a nightmare. They squeezed three liters of blood out of me, she grimaced. Oh, come on, three liters. Angela, I need to talk to you. About what? She asked tensely for some reason. I spoke to the doctor. He told me some terribly shocking news, I replied, pausing for a moment. 
What? But what? Why are you silent? Peter, what happened? Angela, they suspect you have cancer. What? exclaimed Angela. Her face grew even paler, and a silent pause fell between us as each tried to fathom why this had happened and how to come to terms with it. However, the hope that perhaps it was a mistaken diagnosis still flickered inside each of us. I told you. I told you it was necessary to get checkups more often, I almost cried. Peter, but you know I hate hospitals. I took her hand and kissed it. Holding her hand in mine, I prayed that the doctors were wrong, and it turned out to be something simple and harmless. But we had to wait for some time until we received a definite result. Angela stayed in the hospital, and I went home. I wanted to stay with my wife, but she convinced me there was no need, and she also asked me not to tell anyone, especially the kids, for the time being. I came home in a gloomy mood. I didn't feel like celebrating or seeing anyone at all. In the evening, however, Mark called me and reminded me of myself. Apparently, he realized from my sad voice that something was wrong, and he tried to ask me about everything. Hey, why are you calling? Just ask around? I told you everything's fine, I nervously replied. Alright, I just wanted to know. The celebration is in a few days. Monica found some organizer and wants to bring them over to check things out. Seems like she wants to spruce up the house a bit. I didn't delve into the details. She's handling all of that. For me, the main thing is to have something to drink and eat. My gourmand friend was starting to piss me off. It was such a bad time for him to call me with his question. I didn't really care right now. But in order not to fight with my friend, I told him that I couldn't answer him yet and asked him to call me back the next day, or better in two days. I called my wife several times to check on her condition. She said she was feeling better, but the doctors were hovering over her like she was some kind of lab rat. Satisfied with her response, I went to sleep. I had been drained over the past half day and was extremely tired. In the middle of the night, I woke to heavy knocking on the door. I couldn't understand what had happened and initially thought maybe something had gone wrong with the neighbors. But when I opened the door, I saw Monica on the doorstep, continuing to knock loudly. When the door suddenly swung open, she nearly punched me in the forehead. What happened? I asked, in a still sleepy voice. Oh, so you don't know, handsome. Or should I call you a goat? Monica rudely stepped inside, and I closed the door behind her, still not comprehending. It's midnight. Monica, are you high? Why are you so agitated? I glanced at the clock. Why agitated? Let me tell you. That goat. He. Did you know your beloved is a whore? Did you? No? Well, now you know, Monica rambled, heading to the kitchen. She found a bottle of vodka in the fridge and began to serve herself, pouring a drink into a glass. Then she looked at me and poured another for me. Here. Drink. You need it too. I don't get it. I pushed the glass away. Monica, explain clearly what you're talking about. Monique took a drink of the alcoholic beverage, almost choking, and then took a deep breath. I knew it. I caught them. You understand, Peter? She came close to me, pressing her hands against my shoulders. Those bastards. They didn't even care. I walked in, and they were kissing. She broke into hysterical tears without shedding a single tear. Who the hell? Mark and Angela. They were kissing right in her hospital room. They thought no one would see them. I followed them. And he... Damn it. She let go of me and sat on a stool. Stop, Monica. Are you sure? Maybe you misunderstood? I still couldn't believe what I was hearing. Oh, if only... She rested her elbow on the table, burying her head in her hand. Her face showed pain, 
disgust, anger, and a desire for revenge. She was my friend. Okay, that male dog. But I never expected this from her. I sat down on the stool, took a glass and drank it too. I didn't want to believe that Monique was telling the truth. But why would she lie, especially about something like this? I had a strong urge to tear both of them apart, Mark and my wife. I could feel my blood boiling and the rage pulsing through my temples. I couldn't sit still and ruminate any longer. Asking Monica to get ready, I threw on a jacket over my pajamas and prepared to drive to the hospital immediately to talk to my wife. Still in shock from what she witnessed, Monica asked to come along. When I agreed, she got up, grabbing the bottle. As we drove, she continued to drink from it, hoping the alcohol would calm her nerves. During the trip, she told me her version of what happened. She said that in the evening, Mark went somewhere, telling her he was just going for a walk. But for some reason, Monica didn't believe him. Over the years, she had learned a lot about him and now knew when he was lying and when he was telling the truth. So, she decided to follow him. Following his route, she saw that he went to the hospital and at first thought that her husband had simply decided to visit a sick friend. When Monica entered the hall, Mark was already out of sight, so she went to buy a chocolate bar from the vending machine, intending to visit the friend too. However, when she approached the room, through the slightly open door, she saw Mark and Angela kissing passionately, as if they were in a passionate affair. She couldn't believe her eyes and stood still for a few seconds to make sure it was true. Monica hoped that her cheating husband was just taking advantage of Angela's vulnerable state and that Angela would push him away. But that didn't happen. On the contrary, their hands intertwined in embraces, and they started caressing each other. Then Monica stormed into the ward and started shouting, You damn cheater! So, this is what you're up to? And you, you, you were my friend. Worthless bitch. Monica attacked her husband, scratching his face with her long nails. And when he yelped in pain and surprise like a puppy, she also lunged at Angela, trying to tear out her hair. Only when the nurse and orderlies rushed in due to the commotion did they pull her away. You stay here, I said when we arrived. No way. I'm coming with you. I want to look this slut in the eye and hear her excuses. As we reached the ward, a nurse in the corridor stopped us. She found it odd that we appeared at such a time and in such a state. Let me in. I need to see my wife. I yelled. But she's under sedation right now. You won't be able to talk to her anyway, the nurse protested. But I wasn't backing down. And while we were engrossed in conversation, Monica took the opportunity and sneaked into the ward where Angela was indeed lying asleep. Continuing our argument, the nurse and I noticed Monica was missing and realized she was in the room. We rushed there. I saw Monica standing over Angela with a furious expression, tightly holding her by the throat with one hand, trying to strangle her, and for some reason, not letting go of a bottle in her other hand. You'll pay for this, bitch. She hissed, and Angela, almost turning blue, couldn't utter a word, weakly trying to pull Monica's hand away. Seeing this horrific scene, I rushed to Monica, trying to pull her away from my wife. With difficulty, I managed to do so. Monica, have you lost your mind? I asked after dragging her into the corridor. Let this bitch die. You want that too, don't you? Staggering around, Monique was pointing her finger at me. Even if she's guilty, you can't do this. You'll end up in jail, you fool. Go to the car. I'll come soon, I ordered. I'll call the cops now, the nurse peeked out from the door. Monica didn't want to end up in jail, so she decided to follow my advice. Rot in hell, bitch. She shouted towards the ward and staggered away. I returned to the ward. The nurse continued to calm Angela, examining her neck and conducting a general preliminary examination. I waited those few minutes until the nurse finished. Angela sat on the bed paler than ever, scared to move out of fear, realizing that I already knew everything. 
It's better for you to leave too, the nurse told me. But I'm her husband. I want to stay with her. I promise nothing will happen to her, I softly reassured the nurse, convincing her to trust me. She genuinely believed that a husband wouldn't harm his wife and left the ward, promising to return later. When we were alone, I took a chair and sat next to my wife. At first, I didn't say anything, just silently watched her, observing every wrinkle and reading every emotion on her face. I saw fear and remorse. So why are you silent? I finally asked. At the sudden interruption of the silence, Angela even flinched, as if she had been touched by something very cold. She didn't know what to say. She knew she was at fault, and she wanted to be forgiven. She wished it were all just a bad dream. But as much as she wished it was, she realized it wasn't a dream at all. Peter, I... I'm sorry. She cried, bowing her head. You know, I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. The words surprised her, and she looked up at me. She didn't know what I was getting at, but she was preparing herself for the worst, and she expected me to slap her, too, and more than one. But she didn't dare admit that she'd given in to her feelings for Mark, realizing that they were very strong. Why are you silent? I continued. Surprised? I suspected this would happen, again. I watched as horror filled her eyes, and her lips trembled with fear. Angela, you've always been an angel to me. I've always loved you and praised you. You were my grace, my honey, the icing on the cake. Yes, I loved you very much. I even forgave you when you slept with my friend twenty years ago. Yes, I knew about it. I always knew. That evening, I stood at the door and saw everything. Both of you were so drunk you didn't even notice me. I paused for a few seconds, these memories always being painful for me. In that moment, I wanted to rush in and kill you both. But somehow I didn't. I don't know why. Now I do. You gave me my beautiful children. And you know. The next day, after that stupid night, I thought you were going to confess everything to me and beg for forgiveness. But you didn't do that either. And then I got really angry. I wanted to get drunk first, to take away my pain a little bit, because if I snapped at once, I would not just kill you. I don't even know what I would do to you. So I went down the street to a kiosk and bought a bottle. I sat down on the embankment, and I started drinking. And then I saw a priest who sat down next to me and asked me what my grief was. You know, I told him everything, why I was so angry and what I was going to do. Then he put his hand on my shoulder and told me about the power of forgiveness. He told me a lot of things. But while he was talking, I even forgot I had a bottle in my hand. But after talking to him, I felt a great relief, and only then was I able to forgive you. And I lived with you all these years, believing that you really loved me. I even saw in your eyes that you were sorry for what you did. But you, you snapped again. Now it was my turn to bow my head. After hearing my speech, Angela realized how foolish she had been and was now ready to beg for forgiveness on her knees. And she did. She slid off the bed and clung to my feet. The sensor slipped from her hand, and the monitor emitted a warning signal. But neither Angela nor I paid any attention. She kept crying and kissing my feet. A minute later, the nurse was back in the ward. She hooped when she saw the scene. She ran over to Angela, struggled to get her back on the bed, and took a syringe of sedative from her pocket and injected it into her shoulder. What's going on here? The nurse asked me when Angela calmed down a bit and lay back. She just learned the truth. Like me, I said, then stood up and left the ward. Several days passed. Angela's diagnosis was confirmed, and a treatment plan was devised. Now she had to undergo numerous procedures and chemotherapy. She was afraid of what lay ahead but was ready to undergo treatment. It wasn't her illness that scared her anymore. It was the fear that I might never forgive her. I filed for divorce and kicked my wife out of the house. I told her I couldn't bear to see her anymore and planned to talk to the kids myself, hoping they'd understand. 
I later learned that Monique had also filed for divorce, immediately the next day, after catching her husband with a girlfriend. He had to rent an apartment and move in. And somehow, maybe by calling Angela or meeting her, I didn't find out, he invited her to live with him. And it looks like their relationship started to develop. But I didn't care anymore. I didn't want to see her again, and even knowing she'd be in the hospital for a long time, I swore I wouldn't visit her or contribute a penny to her treatment. I had a different goal now. I wanted to find Mark and have a man-to-man -man talk with him, kicking him in the face for betraying our friendship again. But I couldn't find him for a long time, and he wouldn't answer my calls. Only a few days later, I accidentally ran into him on the street. Mark even flinched when he heard my voice behind him. Finally found you, I hissed. Peter, listen. Let's talk. We're friends. Mark didn't finish as he received a strong punch to the face. Mark tumbled to the sidewalk. I jumped on him and hit him a few more times before he managed to get out of it and run. People were looking around at what was going on, but none of them bothered to call the police. Obviously, they just thought that the two comrades, something did not share. That's the human condition. I chased after Mark and was about to run after him. But as he fled, he darted into the road and got hit by a car whose driver hadn't noticed him in time to break. People began to gather around. I realized that someone would definitely call the police now, and I didn't want to have to explain myself to them. I glanced at the body, then turned and disappeared into the crowd. Mark ended up in the hospital with several fractures, but doctors didn't find anything life-threatening. Initially, Angela visited him almost every day, but she had started chemotherapy herself. However, they ran into financial problems, and Angela realized she'd likely have to stop treatment. She shared her intention with the doctor, who looked at her surprisingly and said someone anonymously paid for her treatment. Angela was amazed but thanked the Samaritan and continued her treatment. Later, her children came to visit her, to whom I did confess everything, both about her illness and the fact that we were divorced. Angela, for the next few months, hoped for healing and that she had been forgiven for her sins, as she had previously thought the illness was her punishment for her sins. But one day, a doctor entered her ward and delivered dreadful news. He told her the treatment started too late. If she'd undergone regular checkups, they might have detected the tumor in time, and treatment would have helped. But now, she had to accept the inevitable. Knowing she didn't have long to live, Angela left the hospital without telling anyone. I knew about these events because I secretly met with the doctor, and he told me everything, even some detailed moments of her personal life that she shared with him. Yes, I met with a doctor, because even though I was too angry with my wife, but she was still the mother of my children, and we had lived with her for so many years together, which were quite acceptable and even pleasant before she cheated on me again. So I decided to pay for her treatment, but without her knowing about it. I heard nothing about Angela for some time, where she was or what she was doing. But one day, I met Mark in a bar, thoroughly enjoying himself with some promiscuous girl. I asked him why he was here and where Angela was. He sent away his companion and honestly admitted that when Angela told him the treatment wouldn't help anymore, he initially felt sorry for her. However, soon her appearance started to repulse him. He realized that he didn't love her that much. It was more that he liked the way she looked. And his nature pushed him to drink and have fun with girls again. Naturally, Angela started fighting with him. And then she just disappeared. I was surprised why he hadn't told anyone about it or searched for her. But he just shrugged. Enraged by his inhumane actions, I punched him hard, causing him to fall off the chair and onto the floor, dragging a nearby table with him. I left, leaving that idiot lying on the floor, and headed to the police. They accepted my missing person report, but they couldn't find her. Only three months later, they summoned me to the station to identify the corpse of an unknown woman who, by description, somewhat resembled Angela. I recognized her, barely, but I did. The illness had finished her. The policeman said they found her not far from a shelter for the homeless, where apparently she decided to spend her last days not wanting anyone to see her in such a state. 